When I started to get interested in this, and again, in, in Quebec and in Canada, we were kind of the first ones pioneering this, this model. And then I was in contact with Elliot Coleman about all of this, and then he sent me that picture. And that kind of confirmed that what we were doing really wasn't crazy at all. It was pretty much common sense. And that's a picture that is in his, bo his book, the Winter Harvest book. That was his newest book back then. And he took that in, in France, around Paris, in, in the 1970s. And that was for him, uh, that was a small farm where the grower was like in his 70s and he was still working like his grandfather was working. And that's what Elliot was discovering when he went there, like these small acreage of really densely seeded crops. And his words were, there was quality everywhere. And, and that was really the trigger for him to say, th this kind of farming is really productive and could really give out good yields. So that kind of got me convinced that what I was working on wasn't a fluke. And if basically, if you look at all these old market gardening books or market farming books before the 1940s, everybody was doing this that way because there wasn't any tractor to kind of imagine doing it another way. So basically on 30 inch we'll have our rows, then we cultivate between the rows once or twice, and then the crop shades out the weeds by itself. This picture is of what is pretty much happening year-round on my farm, crops that are undercover. And because of the insect pressures that we're getting from you guys, <laughs> it's getting more and more complicated to grow. So even the mechanized growers that are super efficient with the tractors, they're facing this challenge of having crops that need to be covered. So if that's the setup and you're cultivating with a tractor, well, you need to remove the row cover, but also the hoops. That's time consuming. So even the mechanized growers now that are my friends that farm like five or 10 acres, they're now thinking more about these closed spacings because they'll need to go with, with ho hand hose anyway. So, this to say that in all of this, you know, even if you're mechanized, this cropping system has usefulness, especially if you're growing four season under shelters, greenhouse, and when you have limited amount of space, obviously. So five rows of carrots on 30 inch, okay? For some people, that's common sense. For, for other, this is like, you guys are crazy, that won't work. And, and we're pulling out nice sized carrots. And so carrots are a great indicator of if what you're doing with the soil works for the plant. And you know, you, you see the spacings here. You know, our carrots are not perfect. We have soil with rocks, whatever. But that's fine because we don't need perfect carrots. What I've learned through all these years selling at market is people don't want to have big, big size vegetables. They want to have vegetables that are tasty. They want to have nantes that have been harvested the day before and that are super fresh and that they break in a snap. And that's what, that's what we're there for, okay? So with the years, we've figured out, you know, again, the crop spacings and the management practices to uh, get a balance between yields, quality and caliber, which is really the triple bottom line that you want in these kind of cropping systems. And I really like that picture because that's Modelen, so that's my partner in this project. And it's crazy, like when the book came out, it got really hot in France and in Belgium. And these guys were, were highly skeptical. And so you had all these young people that were looking up to us saying, yo, these guys are doing it in Canada, we can do it too. And so all these agronomists that were supposed to know it all, they, they felt the pressure to come down and see for themselves if it was a fluke. And most of these guys, you know, they, they would take the plane to come down and visit our farm. We would host them, it was like, fine. And it seemed that all they wanted to do was just try and convince us that what we were doing shouldn't work or wouldn't work. Or, and, and it was always the same kind of like, First impression, they would get here to the farm and then they were like, oh, this is it. 
We've heard so much. We've heard so much about you. And, and, and we thought, uh, we, you know, then they think we thought it was bigger. <laughs> but they know that I don't say that because I, I, uh, my, my catchphrase is we're growing better. <laughs> anyway, so. And then and they're like, okay, you know. And then we walk around the fields and then they see quality, yields, and caliber. And then, you know, that's fine. They still go back and they're not convinced. But that's what they saw. So this works, okay? This works for us. This works for growers elsewhere. This works in Kentucky. This works in Asia. This works. So I rest my case, okay? I don't, I, I'd rather not continue to try and convince people about this. And I'd rather explain why this works for people who are willing to try it out. Because again, there's a lot of advantage in this cropping system, especially if you're starting out. Okay? So, our land constraint on the farm was kind of a blessing in disguise because it, it forced us to look at different ways to get more yields, ex which is usually you try to expand, you grow more of everything. We didn't have that space, so we needed to optimize everything that we were doing. And a couple of examples of this. We used to have onions and set like these. And then we changed the way we're doing things where we transplanted them in, in clumps of three. And by doing so, you know, it goes three times faster to transplant, which in itself is pretty cool. It's also a lot easier to weed, to cultivate the soil around the onion sets. And there's more yield per square foot. Another one is leeks. Perhaps some of you guys have heard me tell that story. But it took us quite a few years to grow nice leeks because we didn't know what nice leeks were. We were growing leeks and they were fine. And we would often get comments at the farmer's market about the quality of our leeks. But actually, we had always one lady that would complain. And she was from France. And she would always say, oh, you guys are real amateurs. You obviously do not know how to grow leeks. This is a disgrace. I throw your leeks to the pigs. I buy them because I have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> they have a way to say things sometimes. And you know, you're there, you're bringing your stuff, and you're like, these are like your babies, and you feel, you know, what's up? <laughs> what's up, lady? <laughs> Chill out. But then we went to France, and then we figured it out, because we would go to farmer's market, and th there was leeks with like super blanched stem, because in France, they don't eat. They only eat the white part. The rest, they throw to the pigs. Okay, it was like, fine. So we came back and said, OK, we'll grow leeks with really nice blanched stem. And the way you do this is that you heal them with dirt as they grow. So on a 30-inch bed system, you have two rows to leave enough space for dirt to be mounted. So we changed the way we're doing things. And instead of healing them, we started to bury them. So we had a dibbler made. And the size of the dibbler that pokes the hole is the size of the white stem that we wanted. And basically, we went to that French woman and said, Madame, fine, how long do you want them to be? We will customize to your lucky. <laughs> and then she said, nine inch. No, she said in metrics, in centimeters. She said 20 centimeters. And then, so that story goes that because we're doing this, why this story is important, besides you know, laughing at French people, as we went from two rows to three. So that's 100% more production per square foot just by changing the way we were doing things. We optimized. OK? So then another man came to me and said, oh, JM, you're talking about efficiency. I, I'm seeing there with you. You're poking like 5,000 holes one by one. So he made us like a three-hole dibbler. That speeded up that process too. You know, instead of it taking two days to make whole, now we, we, we do them in like four hours. So we just gained a lot of time in the busiest time of the year. So growing leeks, we want them to grow uh, that way. You need to grow them really high. So they need to be about 10 inch. If you're planting them nine inch deep, you need to have more soil. And you need to start them earlier. So you know, you're tweaking the way you're doing things. But in the end, 
All of this is done inside the greenhouse, which is not a land constraint. We don't have a constraint of space in the greenhouse. So we did this for a couple of years, and then it really got me. I'm, I'm, sometimes I can get a bit cocky, and I felt like I wanted to prove to the French that, you know, we could do these leaks. So now we started to, to cover them with straw once they were buried, and then we started to have like 12, 15 inch. <laughs> Why Sam? And then I would, you know, I would go and say, you know, Madame, <laughs> did your grandfather do this? And, and, you know, and that works. So you can have fun that way, but so. Okay, another story. We were growing tomatoes in hoop houses. I showed you a picture. We had two hoop houses that were 16 feet wide by 100 feet. And so I had visited other greenhouse operations and I thought, no, no, we need to change this. And so we replaced the two hoop houses by one 32 feet greenhouse, higher, more volume, more light, but same space. And then we hired an agronomist to teach us how to grow tomatoes more professionally. And so with him, we learned how to graft the plant which in a nutshell is having two sorts of tomato plants, one with the rootstocks, it being very resistant to diseases and very prolific, and another plant that gives you the tomato that you want. And when early on in their stage, you just cut the heads of both and then you clip them together and then you get the best of both worlds in one plant. You have the roots that you want and you have the head that you want. And that's how you go around not having a rotation in your greenhouse and planting tomatoes year after year after year after year after year for 20 years if you want. And there's growers that have been doing this for 35 years with no pressure of soil-borne disease with regards to the plant. Okay, so we learned that. Not complicated, not easy, but we needed to, we needed to learn. And then we learned how to plant with regards to densities. You know, the books that you get about how to grow yields of tomatoes is nothing compared to you know professional greenhouse tomatoes so we learned that we learned how to trim the plant we learned how to calculate you know the number of fruit per clusters to make sure that the growth is always moving on forward we've learned all of this skill set which basically equated to going from x amount of tomatoes in our field tunnels to 20 times x the amount of tomatoes on the same space. It was just about learning how to do things better. Okay? And man, these tomatoes, we sell them on the cheap at three bucks a pound. And we sell, you know, we harvest a thousand five hundred pounds per week in that in that tomato house. So it's a real money maker. Okay? Same thing happened with cucumbers. We learned how to trace them. We learned how to just grow and grow them going upward. And you know, a hundred feet of cucumbers, of 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 row of cucumber plants, they, they give us a hundred cucumbers per week. So a lot of yield per square foot. Again. It was all about learning how to do this. It wasn't about buying another hoop house, clearing up more land, going further out. It was just about acquiring the skill set, which I think, as market gardeners, is really how we can compete with bigger mechanized growers, by doing things better, by doing them more efficiently, and by trying to always focus on optimizing instead of just spreading out. These uh, cucumber plants, the way we go about them is that we grow them in starts and then we repot them in bigger pots. We leave them, we leave them for about eight weeks in the greenhouse that is heated opt at optimal temperatures. And while this is happening, I'm putting clear plastic the, on the soil of my greenhouse or my hoop house. So I'm really warming up the soil. And then mid-May, I transplant big plants that are ready to go. They're fruiting the next week. And by the 1st of June, I have production going. So they're really in the soil for two weeks before they're ready to, 
to start up. And you know, this is another example. You've, you'll hear a lot of veteran growers say you can't transplant, you know, cucumbers. I don't get it. You can't. Okay? We've been doing this for 10 years and it works really well. 